Mic broken. Ah, there, there it is. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for that wonderful welcome. Um, this is a live reading, uh, a cold read of a, a portion of Dungeon Crawler Carl 7. Matt, what the hell are we doing here? Hey, everybody. So, um, thank you so much for coming. We are going to be reading today. Um, Jeff has a relatively short, it's not that short, but it, it's Part of chapter five of Dungeon Crawler Carl, book seven. Um, if you haven't read, mm -hmm. seven hasn't come out yet, obviously. So um, I'm going to, if you haven't read book six, that's okay. Um, if this is mostly spoiler free. I'll give a quick setup as to what, what happened before. So you know a little bit about what's going on. Um, two things happen at the end of book six that you need to know. One, um, Carl got his head stuck somewhere near the end of book six. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result of that, he's lost all of his hair. Um, also near the end of book six, um, another character died and that character gave Carl her pet um, to take care of. And Donut does not know about this pet yet. That's what, the, but Donut does not like this pet. <laughs> and immediately preceding this scene, um, another character named Samantha uh, mentions casually in chat about this Carl having this pet. So what we're about to pick up off, um, several things are going on in this chapter because it's this is a full chapter, um, but that's what immediately preceded it. She just found out that Garrett the tummy acre is in Carl's inventory and that's where we are. All right. So real quick, before I get started, I've been told by the powers that be that anybody who's playing the con game, uh, the lit RPG track code word is stats. <laughs> Lerp. Glurp. Um, we're going to read, and then afterwards we're going to have a Q and A. Yep. And because I mean, we have an hour, so maybe we could all go to the bar or something afterwards. Yeah. You have a signing. I have I have a signing at one. Um, what today? What's it's one now? Or yeah. Or I don't know what's two. At two, okay. At two. Not this one. The next one. One plus one. Yeah. Okay, so I did. Uh, all right, this is mostly a cold read. Probably the first five minutes, I think, is I, I did already narrate in Toronto. So this is this is going to be expanded. Everybody, make yourselves comfortable, and I hope you enjoy the show. Carl, is it Garrett? Do you have Garrett? You said he died! I did not say that, and it's not... Well, it is him, technically, but it's... In all of my life, I have never felt a sense of betrayal this profound, Carl! Are Mongo and I being replaced? Is that what's happening here? You're replacing us! Don't calm the fuck down. Nobody is replacing anybody. Why haven't you told me about this, then? <gasps> it's an affair. <laughs> it's the same sort of thing. You're having an affair! And to think the other woman is a meatball! How are you ever going to look Mongo in the eye again? That doesn't even make sense. Will you stop freaking out for one second and, and let me explain? Explain? What is there to explain? I expected this from Miss Beatrice, but not you. Come on, Mongo. Call us a new best friend. Let's go someplace where we're wanted. Mongo squawked in confusion, looking back and forth between me and her. Oh, for fuck's sake. Donut, chill the fuck out and let me tell you what happened. And, uh, let me pull him out. Pull him out? Why? Is he hungry? Does he want a dinosaur snack? Mongo, stay with mommy. I'm more worried about the other way around. Okay, Mongo, don't eat him. I zapped the level one tummy acre out onto the table. Carl, what are you doing? Don't you dare bring that thing! Donut stopped her rant in mid-sentence to stare at the tiny creature. The miniature round meatball thing rolled across the table and stood up on his two stout legs, looking at Donut. He spun in a circle, small mouth agape as he took in the room. 
He was half the size of my fist. He did not have the same mohawk like these things usually had, but a spattering of black hairs atop his not-quite-perfectly round head. The first one of these things I'd seen was red-tagged, but this one wasn't. I didn't know if that was because he used to be Ren's pet or because of my peace symbol patch plus my higher charisma. He still had the same pronounced underbite as Garrett, his single round tooth sticking straight up. Carl, that is most certainly not Garrett. He doesn't even have a name! Donut examined him closely. Goodness, what a strange little... No, Mongo, no! Mongo stopped just short of gobbling the baby up, mouth inches away. <laughs> the little monster made a ridiculously cute, high-pitched giggling noise and shuffled closer to the confused dinosaur and jumped right into Mongo's open mouth with a hop. He rolled over inside the dinosaur's mouth, little elephant-like feet waving in the air as he continued to giggle. <laughs> Mongo's eyes went huge as he suddenly didn't know what to do. Mongo, spit him out this instant! You're going to get some weird disease! Mongo did not spit him out. Instead, he seemed to contemplate for a moment before he lifted his head in the air and swallowed. God damn it, Mongo! <laughs> I cried, waiting for the dinosaur to teleport away. He did not. Well... That didn't last long, now did it? Mongo, we do not eat people unless Mommy gives the order. Carl, if he gets worms, I'm blaming you. He looked like someone who might give, him, might give him worms. Why didn't Mongo get in trouble? Are pets allowed to attack pets in safe rooms? I looked over to the crafting studio, wondering if we should call Mordecai out. If that thing regenerated but was still in Mongo's stomach, that could be bad. I think it's because he was suicidal, Carl. He climbed right into his mouth. She looked over at the dinosaur. Uh-oh. She started to back away. With a... <coughs> noise, Mongo yacked the meatball back out onto the table. The little ball rolled out, balancing and giggling. Mongo made a move to gobble him back up, but Donut shouted for him to stop. Ew! Look at what you made Mongo do! Mongo closed his mouth and made an uncertain peep. He reached forward to sniff the creature. The meatball made a little grunting noise and tried to climb back into Mongo's mouth. Mongo backed up and ran to the back of the room. Carl, you're cheating on me with an imbecile! I sighed and re-examined the little guy. Male tummy acre. Level one. This is a pet class mob. This pet is not bonded with a crawler. This pet has died five times. As such, this pet's stats are all buffed by 125%. This pet has five weaknesses. Weaknesses may only be examined if you are bonded with this pet or if you have him contained within a carrier. Tummy acres, also known as belly acres, also known as colon worms, are named such because they were originally parasites, living in the intestinal tracts of Jotun-class titans. They are generally good-natured, though infants can be a little diff difficult to control. They are voracious eaters, and when they reach full size, can swallow just about anything. They have multiple tank-based special abilities and are generally resistant to most types of damage. They can survive in almost any environment. In addition, while not necessarily known for their offensive skills, their wrecking ball attack is considered a terror on any battlefield. They may be dumb, they may smell a little like expired chorizo, but holy shit are they adorable. At its current regeneration level, this tummy acre will reach full size upon ascending to level 25. This particular pet is unique in that it will regenerate upon death as long as their body has not been destroyed. After each regeneration, they will be stronger than before, their overall stats getting buffed by an additional 25%. They will retain their size and strength upon regeneration except upon every five deaths, wherein they will revert to level one and lose their memories. Bonded pets will have to be rebonded at this time. You must change their name as well. After 10 deaths, their full, potential si their full potential size doubles. 
Warning! This pet will not regenerate if it dies before it hits level 5. Warning! Upon death, they will receive a new random weakness. This weakness generally results in insta-death. The more deaths, the higher the chance the weakness will be something common, like contact with water. It's considered quite rare for a tummy acre to survive past 10 deaths, thus it's not advisable to, del to deliberately allow your pet to die in order to increase its strength. Five weaknesses? So it's stupid and defective? <laughs> the thing, still dripping with mongo goo, rolled onto his back and started making gurgling noises. <sighs> My goodness, is it adorable, though? Ugly adorable. Carl, this is not Garrett. This is a baby. I know, Donut. If you let me explain, I can tell you what happened. We didn't have the time at the end. We didn't have the time at the end of the last floor. I moved to the food box and pulled out what was supposed to be a sausage breakfast sandwich as I finished telling Donut the story. We just received notification that Katya had finally made it into their safe room. They were going to open Louis' celestial box and then come over here. We can't keep him calm, Donut said, as she watched the little guy run in circles around the floor. Mongo had decided he wasn't food after all and was bouncing back and forth, pretending to pounce. The meatball thought it was hilarious. What the hell? I muttered. Instead of my usual sandwich, this was a steaming bowl with my sandwich within crumbled up. The bowl was filled with a thick white soup. I sniffed it, and it smelled like seafood. Chowder style is supposed to be optional, I said, examining the food box controls. I slammed my fist against the door, and the device let out an angry beep. I can't eat this! Carl, if we're going to heal our relationship, you need to pay attention to me. I am paying attention. Hey, uh, Garrett, too, come here and eat this, I said, putting the bowl on the floor. Both Mongo and the meatball scrambled toward the bowl, but a shout from Donut caused Mongo to pause. Garrett made an excited glurping noise and hopped face first into the chowder. He popped up, looked at the dinosaur, and made a growling noise. <laughs> the first sign of aggression at all. Donut gasped in outrage as Mongo backed up. The tiny creature disappeared into the white mix and started to devour the chowder. I promised Ren I would look after him. I feel obligated. First off, it's not going to let you keep his original name. You will absolutely not name him Garrett 2 or Garrett 5 or Garrett 6 if you want to be super technical. Absolutely not. I once knew a Bombay named Trixie's Secret Talent, Take Two, named after her own mother, and let me tell you, it gave that cat serious mental issues. The worst attention whore I've ever seen, which is saying a lot, especially for a Bombay. Honorifics are one thing, but being known as a second edition, like a photocopy? Can you imagine? That's a hard no, Carl. The last thing we need is that thing being even more mentally unstable than it already is. And anyway, it sounds like Ren hoisted him on you without asking. Maybe you can give him to Louis or Brittany. They both seem lonely. The thing popped up from the bowl and looked at me, eyes huge. His dot had changed from white to orange. Too late. Man, that was a lot easier than getting Mongo to bond. Ren said we had to feed him a few times, but it only took one bowl. Congratulations! You have bonded with Tommy Acre, level one. A new tab is available in your interface. Bonded Pets. Please see this tab for more information. Your guild has pet stables installed. New options are available in your Bonded Pets tab. Your tummy acre requires a name. Please choose a name now! <laughs> he said, looking at me. He burped. Sorry, I can't burp on you, man. It's not, not one of my powers. Donut scoffed again, looking back and forth between me and the meatball. He bonded easily because he's an idiot, Carl. There was more food in the bowl than he could possibly eat, and he pushed himself out, using his legs to jump and roll. He splotched onto the floor, leaving a trail of white chowder. Overhead, the cleaner bot made a disapproving bleep. He burped again and then started to push the bowl across the floor, thrusting it toward Mongo, who let out an excited squawk and rushed forward. The dinosaur stuck his head in the bowl and licked the rest of it up in a handful of seconds. Do you know who Cousin Oliver is, Carl? 
Donut demanded, watching the display. Uh, was he that one cat with the really weird eye? No, Carl, that was my sister cousin, Ginger Snap, and we don't talk about her. <laughs> cousin Oliver was from the Brady Bunch. This thing is like that. Cousin Oliver, Scrappy-Doo, Guppy on iCarly, April on Gilmore Girls. She spat out that last one. All late series editions, all attempts to add something new and cute and exciting to a perfectly good cast that ended up making everything worse. Uh-oh. Anyway. I grinned and gave Donut a pat. <laughs> Don't worry. You'll always be my number one girl. I'm sure that's what they said to Mary-Kate and Ashley before those other twins arrived. <laughs> Jesus, Donut. How do you even know all this stuff? Katia came into the room, followed by Bautista and Louie. Samantha sat on Louie's shoulder, talking animatedly. It made him look like he had two heads. We are putting a pin in this car, but I am serious. He is cute now, yes, but they always are when they're young. We need to give him to someone who's not already spoken for in the pet department. I don't care if he's bonded or not. She turned to face the others. Hi, Katia! Hi, Louie! Hi, Katia's boyfriend! Katia patted my, sh patted my shoulder and picked up the container for the rev-up hair tonic and started reading the instructions. The thing came with multiple trays and brushes. Let's do Carl's hair, and then we can go out and look at Louis's new toy. Uh, we are going to use it to kill Tish. <laughs> Samantha added. She made a whistling noise, followed by an explosion with her mouth. Uh... No, we're not, Louis said. I don't even know who that is. Donut let out a sniff. Samantha, you shouldn't hold Tish accountable for what happened. That was 100% Gotti's fault. I'm going to kill her. And I'm going to kill Katia for not allowing me to slake my need for revenge. Samantha, what did I tell you about threatening people? And how did you even get out? I went out the door, Carl. I went looking for my child, but then Louis told me he was at the college, and I went to kill her before she could steal him from me like she tried to do to Katsi. 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 I finally remembered what all this was about. Gatsi was the now-dead Mad Dune Mage from the Sandcastle during the Bubble Floor. He'd been the one who had the last part of the Gate of the Feral Gods. He'd been trying to animate his sex doll using the gate, but the whole thing, the whole time, he was being tricked by Samaith, trying to get her body back, who'd possessed the sex doll body. She was only a head because Mongo had knocked her over while she was made of glass or then broken her body. Samantha had tricked Gatsi into marrying her sand ooze daughter, something I still didn't fully understand, before everything had gone to shit. Once Gatsi had realized he'd been tricked, he had written to the college here in Loracos asking for help. We'd found the letters. In those letters, it was revealed that Gatsi's ex-girlfriend, Tish, still worked at the college and that he'd left her for the sex doll. I remembered that Samantha had some choice words for Tish earlier. Wait. Did you find your child? Samantha brightened. She's here. I can feel her. But she's in the castle of the stinky dwarfs. She's still in the water. Carl, we need to go get my body taken care of, and then I can get in the water and reunite with my child. She turned to Louis and gave him a hard stare. But if you are not going to let me blow Tish up, I'm going to tell Juicebox about your affair with her. I'll have her do my dirty work for me. What? Louis asked. But Samantha was already distracted by the baby tummy acre who'd walked up to Louis and was banging against his foot, looking up at him. <gasps> oh my god, he's so cute! <laughs> Samantha cried. She rolled off Louis's shoulder and bounced on the ground. She did a few circles around the small meatball. Okay, Carl promised me I could name you. No, I did not. But we do need to name him now. I have the window up on my interface, and I can't get rid of it until we come up with something. Is... is that Garrett? Louis asked, going to a knee. What happened to him? You doing okay, little buddy? <laughs> the tummy acre said. Donut started giving a quick, heavily redacted and stilted version of the story.
While she did this, Katya pulled out one of the little plastic trays and started mixing some of the tonic. Katya produced a towel from her inventory and tied it around my shoulders and then grew an extra set of hands to hold my head steady. Don't move, Carl. It's different for eyebrows and hair. There's a dozen different types of hair, all with different mixes. That's why it's so complicated. Your, your eyelashes are also gone, so there's a third mix I have to do. It's almost identical to the pubic hair recipe, so I have to be extra careful with that one. <laughs> this first one is easy. She took the swab and carefully rubbed it over my left eyebrow. I felt the tingle of hair start to sprout. Uh, you doing okay? I asked, keeping my voice low. I'm hanging in there, she said as she leaned over me, working. Mordecai is brewing something for me right now. Says it might help with the rehab. We're going to do that tomorrow, so I'm done with it before the ceasefire ends. Don't wiggle. She wiped it across my right eyebrow. She leaned back. Good. Now you don't look so freakish. Eyelashes next. And then, after her deathbed confession, she had the absolute gall to hoist her mentally unstable dinosaur murderer child on Carl. <laughs> she knew he wouldn't say no, because Carl doesn't say no to anybody. I have half a mind to name him Cousin Oliver, or Scrappy. He only gets three strikes before he's out on the street, and he's already used up one of them by growling at Mongo. I feel bad about her. About Wren, Louis said. She died, but Carl figured out how to save everyone like an hour later. She was done, I said, remembering how she looked at her friend. Getting out would have, wouldn't have mattered. She left on her own terms. Don't feel bad about it. She went out like a badass. Don't you dare move, Katya said. She held an even smaller cotton swab now as she pulled my head into place. This is the eyelash, re this is the eyelash recipe. Close your eyes and don't even breathe. She started dabbing on the edge of my eyelids. If you can't keep his name, you should name him Meatball, Louis said. Or Balzac. I like Balzac. <laughs> <laughs> We're not naming him Balzac. God damn it, Carl, don't move. Okay, now open. I blinked to see Donut right in front of me, carefully inspecting my eyelashes and brows. She leaned in super close. The eyelashes are longer than before, which makes him look slightly more feminine. Otherwise, this is quite good work, Kosya. Very nice. Your cosmetology skills are much better than your sewing. <laughs> she took a step back and looked me up and down. Is there a beard setting? I feel as if we should try a beard with all those filthy tattoos, you know, to lean into the look. No. The name your new pet box remained persistent on my interface. The small creature had turned from Louis and was now rubbing itself on Bautista's hairy foot. The tiger crawler also went to a knee and gave him a pet. The tummy acre started to purr. I have a pair of stuffed tummy acres, Batista said, but I haven't tried using them yet. I suspect they're much bigger than this one. Do you want him? I'll sell him to you. Five gold. He is not for sale. Louis snapped his finger. How about Sherman? Like for a Sherman tank or tugboat? It fits because Carl was in the Navy. <sighs> I do like tugboat. Absolutely not. I will not have you saying, God damn it, tugboat, over and over again. <laughs> Can you imagine how annoying that would be? Katya pushed the small trays aside and was now mixing the tonic for the top of my head in the large main tray. She kept moving back to the instructions to make certain she was doing it correctly. Hmm. She said after a moment. Hey, Louis, can you go into the guild and grab Splash Zone for me? I'm going to need him for this next part. Splash zone? Donut asked as Louis scurried away. Why do we need a stripper? Is he going to give Carl a lap dance? <laughs> well, I am naming him Kimmy, Samantha announced as she followed Louis out the door. Kimmy the second. I don't care what you call him. He will always be Kimmy to me. Mm. I do like Kimmy, but not Kimmy the second. We don't even know who Kimmy the first is. Guys, this is taking way too long. It's much too built up already. 
It took us like two seconds to name Mongo. <laughs> Mongo was easy because we didn't know about his family. The name for this thing needs to honor the past, but make it clear they're not a copy of someone. Mongo is a good boy and can handle anything. This thing is deranged, and his name requires a delicate touch. Someone's name can have a direct effect on the path they take in life. For example, have you ever met someone named Lacey who wasn't a complete train wreck? <laughs> or a boy named Jake or Jason who didn't think he was always the main character? <laughs> names are important, Carl. Look at my own name. Look at all the names in my family. They are profound, yet they also honor the past. It's a very elegant way to make a bold statement. You have a brother named Skittles. <laughs> and your grandmother was named Princess Chonkalot. My grandmother won over 70 best in shows, I'll have you know. She was one of the most celebrated North American Persians until her granddaughter came along and shattered all her records. You just suggested we name him Cousin Oliver. That was before I realized you were seriously considering keeping him. If you're going to name him after someone... It should be after Ren, Batista said. Donut scarfed. We can't name him Cheetah. <laughs> Daniel's right, Katia said as she continued to mix the tonic in the largest tray. It bubbled, and a splotch landed on the table. The rock-like surface immediately sprouted hair. It should be something that Ren would have liked. Louis and Samantha returned, followed closely by Splash Zone, the short, otter-like water mage stripper. He'd changed from his usual lifeguard outfit to a leather vest and little red boots I recognized as something I'd received in an adventurer box ages ago. Hi, Splashy! Okay, Kasia said to the otter. She placed a hand on top of my head, and the hand started to shape itself around my skull. I'm going to put this stuff on Carl's head, but it can only be on for, like, five seconds. We don't, want it we don't want it uneven, so I have to place it all at once. I'm going to put it on, wait five seconds, then lift my hand. I need you to power wash it off his head when I say so. Got it! Splash Zone said, giving a thumbs up. How strong should I make it? Uh, shouldn't we do this in the bathroom? No. Katia said. She started to wrap plastic around her scoop-shaped hand. The room is too small, and the shower isn't fast enough. Splash, make it strong, just like you do at the club. <laughs> do your wet spot routine. <laughs> Not enough to hurt, but enough to clean off his head fast. Everyone, everyone needs to get out of the way, and the cleaner bot can dry everything up when we're done. The bot let out an angry beep from the ceiling. The water mage pulled himself up onto the table. Okay! Say the word. He started gyrating his hips for no apparent reason. Katia started spreading the bubble concoction on the plastic while she grew more hands to hold me in place. Don't move an inch, Carl. We'll have you lean forward. Guys, I said, suddenly nervous. I'm a little worried about this. <laughs> Don't be a baby, Carl. Miss Beatrice used to get her butthole bleached and her lady garden lasered, and those are much more delicate procedures than this. Donut and the others moved to the back of the room. Louis now had the tummy, tummy acre in his hands. Katia started to place the scoop on my head when Louis shouted, I got it! She paused. What? What? He held the meatball up with two hands, like that monkey in The Lion King. Sir Rendelgore. You know, Sir, S-I-R, like a knight. And then, Rendelgore. You can call him Rend. Sir... Rendell Gore. It fits with the royal court theme, and it still honors the past. Plus, Ren would have loved it. Nobody could ever pronounce her name. She pretended it made her mad, but I think she kind of liked it. Okay, that is a good name. <laughs> Done, I said before anybody else could respond. It's a good name. I typed it into the box and hit enter. Your pet has been named Sir Rendell Gore. Now, can we get this over with? I said, putting my head back down. 
Katya splotched the cold tonic onto my head and started counting down from five. Uh-oh, Splash Zone said. <laughs> that's the end of the script i can't so yeah that's that's book seven right now we're still i'm not done with it yet um if you go on my patreon you can see how far we got um i'm hoping to have it out relatively quickly before the end of the year um hopefully before the release of the re-release of book one on hardcover um but I think what we're doing now is if you guys have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer them. Yeah. And by the way, you guys will be sharing question time with people on the stream in the chat. So we'll kind of, I think what we'll, what we'll do is we'll like trade back and forth. So let's get our first question from the audience here. And a gentleman with the microphone is going to come and give you the microphone. Gentlemen? Well. <laughs> so Matt, I'm one. I'm wondering, I know you have a lot of jokes in the books, and it's really funny. Do you actually burst out laughing sometimes when you're writing the lines, or is it just too much thinking? I do sometimes. Um, usually what's funny to me is imagining Jeff having to read them. <laughs> I, I, I've gotten to the point where, you know, now that I'm past book, because by the time the first book came out in audio, I was already pretty much done with book three. So I didn't have those voices in my head until right around I started book four. And by the time now, I can't get them out of my head. So I, I shape everything I write with audio in mind because it's become such a, you know, important part of this whole story. So usually it's me messing with Jeff is a lot of what gives me the most joy when writing. <laughs> You know, and there's, there's, but there's a lot of jokes that are in or lines that are, I never really considered them jokes, but the way he delivers them become jokes later. And like some of the most well loved lines that people announce talk about, they weren't, I, they, I didn't even think about them when I first wrote them, but it's because of his delivery. And now I've gotten to the point where I, I know his narration style pretty well. So, yes. Um, I do crack up thinking of certain things I'm going to make him say. <laughs> okay, so we have a question from the chat. Uh, Cooper uh, is the person asking this. He says, he or she? Uh, oh, that's you. Okay. All right. How often does Matt make you laugh in the script and break character? Quite often. Um, it, you know, it, it does extend how long it takes me to narrate the audiobook, too, because sometimes... Sometimes I'm like crying laughing. Uh, and this even happens during pre-reads. The, the, one, the one scene that I remember most vividly that I literally was laughing for about 10 minutes straight uh, was when um, Chaco first showed up. And Mordecai was like, you motherfucker! <laughs> um... Yeah, I just about died reading that at first. So it's it's you know this is my favorite project to do because because it, it makes me laugh so often and so hard. So yeah, I mean it, it makes it it makes it a pain in the it makes it a bigger pain in the ass and a bigger joy than anything I'm I'm working on. So if you go on YouTube, he has some of his cold reads um, on YouTube, and there's one from when he was reading book five, and it's up there. If if you search. Uh, Dungeon Crawler Carl Mongo meets Kiwi. That scene, <laughs> it's up there of him reading it for the first time, and he just loses it. So, it was the it was the um, evil, horse. evil horse sex magic <laughs> part. <laughs> that yeah, that sent me for sure. All right, we got another one from the audience. So once this story has come to a completion, are you done with this world? Or are you thinking you might do some side quest stuff or other books? Well, I think that's kind of a complicated question because I'm not sure. Um, Dungeon Crawler Carl is probably going to be 10 books. And when I'm done with it, I, I, 
I don't think in novel form I'm going to do any more books. However, there may be other stories. Um, some things may have already been written uh, that come out in other mediums. Um, the the hardcover version, um, if you haven't heard, uh, Ace Books from Penguin Random House has picked up the print only rights, and they're going to re-release them um, starting in August for the first three books. And those books, I, I've written a novella called uh, Backstage at the Pineapple Cabaret. And it's <laughs> it's in real time with another story that's going on. Um, and it's being told in very short, like 5,000 word parts um, at the end of each version of the book. And the first, I can't tell you what it's about because it's exclusive to the Ace Edition. But the first chapter is from the point of view of Rory the Goblin um, from the first book, the, the one with all the facial piercings and it's after the scene where they blow up all the goblin babies so that's and I I'm actually pretty proud of that story so but, uh, but you know like other books told from other crawler point of views um, we may see something that's not in book form I don't anticipate I never want to say never because I, I mean there are so many different stories I want to tell uh, other series standalone books you know there's only so much time and i'm kind of a slow writer believe it or not so yeah okay so we got something from the chat here oh how did that happen um oh, what is going on with my phone i saw that too his phones maybe let's get an audience question other audience questions Apologies if you've answered this before, but did you plan the ending of the series when you started, or is it something you've kind of just made up as you went? I, I have no idea what the ending is going to be. I don't plan anything ahead. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. There's so in the writing terms, there's plotters and pantsers. A plotter is someone who outlines the whole story ahead of time. A pantsers flies by to see their pants. They just make it up as they go along. And I am a very devout follower of the pantser method i feel as if i knew the ending i wouldn't want to write it anymore um i i i i make things seem like i've been planning them the whole time and it's not true i um i literally write every scene three or four times and decide what the, what the best path for it would be um i have i keep very 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 careful track of everything that's behind me every like little gun that hasn't been fired yet i have it all ready to go and in, in the toolbox i just pull out when a scene needs it and then that makes it look like hey he's been planning this all along there's some little things that i know i come up with and i know that they're going to happen i mean no one's a true pantser because they kind of know but for the most part i have no idea how this series is going to end i don't know who's going to live or who's going to die so okay let's find out so my uh my my Phone's behaving itself now. Um, okay, so Darum Stahl uh, is the next question. Uh, they ask, is Matt going to get a guest voice slot in the audio version of Book 7? <laughs> so, we don't know. Um, <laughs> I have someone on my wish list that I've sent them after. Um, there was another person who had an audiobook that came out at the same time as uh, as book uh, six. six came out. Um, and we were jockeying for number one on Audible Store. She had narrated it. Um, she's an A-list actor who's never going to... A-list? Like S-tier. Like <laughs> S, like... There's there's no way we're going to get her. Yeah, we're, 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 we're going to do we're, we're gonna... But um, I, I haven't written... Her character in but i already know who i'm gonna have her play if we get it so it, I, I can't say anything because i don't jinx it so. yeah yeah totally looking forward to that all right another crowd question so i guess it's kind of related to the last audience question it's writing related um i know you were talking about being a pantser which is mind-blowing um but I was specifically with the character of Samantha uh -huh. I, as I've been listening to her and reading her. Is she, did she ever seem like, was she one of those side characters that you wrote not intending for her to be as big as she was? Like, did she kind of grow on you and then become like 
bigger than you were intending because she has and um, um i've said this before samantha is my favorite side character of all the side characters um I, I when i write characters like that I, I write a lot of like weird characters that may or may not like steve urkel their way into the story um and she has such potential such so much there's so much like mystery behind who she really is and that sort of thing always intrigues me. Plus, she's like ridiculous, and the voice he does for him is hilarious. So, you know, a lot of that comes from me hearing how well she's received, you know, or that character is received. So, there's lots and lots and lots of small side characters in the story. We have, we're like 400 named characters by this point in this. And any one of them, if they're not dead, they can come back at any time. Um, and, as a pantser, I don't know if if it makes sense for them to be in that scene. If that's how it really happened, then I'll bring them back and that's what I'll do. But a lot of it is, you know, it's all about the energy of the scene. You know, I, I, I enjoy that part of the writing process. Well, I like this character. She would be great in this scene. Let's make her in love with Louis for some random reason. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Okay, um, we have a question from at climbing that mountain. They asked, uh, "Is there an estimated release date for book seven? Um, not so much. I'm trying. I'm working my hardest to get it out as soon as possible. I don't want to rush things, but I want to make sure it comes out this year. Um, I also want to make sure I never release a book that doesn't, you know, include the entire floor. And <laughs> this particular book is going to be a bit of a challenge lengthwise. Um, I suspect it'll be shorter from now on after this one, but it's like kind of a hump. So we'll see. I'm doing the best I can. All right. Another crowd question, please. Here we go. So as you're doing your uh, first read through and figuring out like inflections and all that kind of stuff, like what kind of notes do you keep in line with like, the audio text to kind of dictate how you're going to inflect and tone and, and give life to the voices. You mean like what notes do I take during the pre-read? Yeah, effectively. I, I don't take okay. notes. I just, I just, you know, if, if, if a character has an impact on me while I'm reading um, and I come up with a voice for them, it, I'm not going to really forget uh, if they don't have an impact on me then it doesn't matter what I come up with on the fly, you know, as long as it's sufficiently, you know, cartoony or not, depending on the mood of the scene, you know, it, it really, really with like background characters, throwaway characters, it, their, their voice is completely dependent on, on the scene itself. And so that's what I actually take note of in my mind as I'm reading, but I don't, actually write anything down or do any highlighting or, or anything like that. A lot of authors do narrators dirty because they'll be like, the person has all sorts of dialogue and then suddenly in chapter 70, they're like, she said with her Welsh accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like after the chapter, like yeah. the, the end of the chapter. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Another chat question at Rain. Rain. Why am I saying at? Rain asks... When did you start practicing doing voices? When did you know you wanted to do this professionally? Um, I guess you could say I started practicing doing voices as a kid, listening, you know, watching cartoons, um, watching anything, you know, like I, I just like to parrot things. Uh, actually, even the radio and radio commercials, the th things I hate the most are the things I want to mimic the most. Uh, when it, when it, especially when it comes to radio commercials, DJs, whatever, um, I, it, I just have this instinct to, to mock them. Um, so that just came naturally for me as a kid. Uh, but like I never had aspirations to become a voice actor until I was stuck in a position where I didn't want a real job, but I didn't, you know, that I, I just got laid off from a, a regular job. I was like, basically a glorified janitor um, before I was doing this. So, um, yeah, I just, 
I had sound equipment because I was also a mus I, uh, I was also doing music, music a lot, recording a lot of music. So I just had the gear and uh, someone suggested that I give voice acting a try. I was like, all right, all right whatever. And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of it. Like I was doing odd jobs for a while and then I found audiobooks and I, then I was like, oh, yeah, this is what I want to do. Um, so I just stumbled upon it. Uh, I, I don't I don't know that I, I really had a, a, a moment that I decided this is what I wanted to do. It was just like, well, let's give this a shot because I need money. Yeah. Um, I actually have. Um, Matt, I was on your closer. Oh. <laughs> um, when you were talking about building epic worlds yesterday. Uh -oh. And uh, as a fellow Gen Xer, you you mentioned sort of. Did I mess it up again? What if I shake it? Um, you mentioned sort of <laughs> the uh, sort of. I can hear you anyway, so. <laughs> Right. So, answer your second part. Is the does he have built-in air conditioner? The dungeon's cold mostly, so um, except when they're in a desert environment, and then you do want like something over your mouth. Um, but so the question was like finding the balance with social commentary and humor and all that stuff. A lot of I don't do deliberate social commentary. I, it's more of a um, overarching theme that's kind of like baked into the paint that we build that's what the world is uh i you know I, I don't like the idea of preaching at someone preaching to someone um i get called like a conservative nut job i get called a like a liberal woke captain woke or something someone called me the other day i get called both and you know you know people don't even they see what they want to see in it um i i i am kind of like gen x pretty jaded with like how um like how the big person treats the little person basically and all of my fictions like that in some way or another and but it's not something i don't want to i you know i feel authors and musicians and other people who are shouldn't use their platforms to spew things like that they should use their work to show what they feel but they shouldn't use the work itself as like a hidden agenda i guess i just want to tell a story and i just want it to be funny and um, you know exciting and all that mixed in and my personal views sometimes leak in around the edges but i i i think i'm self-aware enough to know what 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 works and what doesn't work and I, i'm not trying to push an agenda i don't want i'm not trying to make anybody think a certain way politically i just want you to understand the point of view of the characters in the story and i think that that's what makes the most compelling fiction is people being as authentic as they can be and you see you read a lot of fiction where someone has an agenda i am going to help fix x and then i'm going to do that by writing this book and then it comes out so stilted and weird and alienating and we don't want that. We just, we're waiting to have a good time. And if you like get a deeper message, that's great. Um, we agree. And if you miss it, that's okay too, because they're still like exploding goblin babies and it's fun. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's do a couple chat questions in a row uh, because one of them's short and one of them I have no idea what the hell they mean. Uh, so Laura asks, what? band shirt are you wearing right now i am wearing a viridian 
or it's like uh it's james hunter are you here um no no he's repping james hunter is not even here the written gate online is a book series by little pg author james hunter and it's very good it's a very expansive series because there's several other books in it but that's what i'm wearing right now i usually am wearing a band shirt um i was wearing a power trip shirt yesterday which had multiple bands on it I don't know what I'll wear tomorrow. I have brought a few. I'm I'm a show for my own company, so I, 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 I you know I wear my own shirts sometimes, but I always feel kind of weird wearing my own stuff. It's like wearing a shirt with your own face on it. It's. We need to get you one of those. <laughs> we do have those Matt Matt's face T-shirts. Um, and okay, so this is the one that was confusing. How far did the characters think they would get in the dungeon? What? How, how far did the characters think they would get in the dungeon? I don't know. I mean, I think they all wanted to survive. <laughs> um, I suspect that question came out the wrong way. Yeah, but I no don't one know. knows. A lot of people, you know, they go in because they didn't have any other choice. And a lot of people ask, well, where are all like Asian people? Because that would have been in the middle of the day. And I think, but I think. A lot of people would have not gone in if it was the middle of the day and they were safe. Um, person, I wouldn't have gone in. You would have been an idiot to go in unless you had to. Um, even, I mean, I'm not going to enter a hole in the ground that just pops up. Um, but there are a lot of people who would just for whatever reason, I believe. So. Okay. Uh, do we have any more crowd questions? Here we are. Cheers. So, Matt, you mentioned, uh, Robert here, uh, you mentioned that you didn't hear the voice until book four, book five? Book four. Book four. The end of uh, book three, really. Because... Okay. And so do you think it's like, and then you love the voices, right? Right. Esther. And so did you find yourself changing the way you you wrote to accommodate? And did, and did you think it changed, like, do you think it maybe enhanced, you know, or do you think there's like this value in thinking about that? Yes and yes. I've, um, I first... So when I wrote, I wrote a book called Dominion of Blades, and it was um, narrated by Andrea Parsonneau, who's an amazing narrator. And um, after that experience, I realized how valuable audio was. And so I had already been writing with audio in mind when I started writing Dungeon Crawl and Crawl. But once I heard his voices and I knew the voices for the characters, um, I, I definitely do shape the, the dialogue, especially like when they're speaking. I, I, I play it out in my head. I actually have a program that I, um, part of my editing process is always having it read back to me. Um, I have like, you know, the computer built in voice on my word. It's not like a great AI style voice. It's just like a robotic, but uh, you know, but there's like, I'm also a musician. So you, the, 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 right. The cadence, the beats, the, um, you want it to everything to be um, like, you want it all to fit. I am not a flowery writer. I don't write like super great prose, but I'm a huge fan of it. There's an author named Guy Gabriel K who writes like poetry and long form basically. And I love that, how the art of making words flow from one to the next. And I do it in a very like hammer style fashion, but that's in, because it's so important to the narrator to be able to read cleanly. So it does affect. And I, I think, as I go along, I, 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 it's a struggle because it's lit RPG. There's lots of stats, lots of that weird game mechanic stuff. And some people don't like that as much. And some people want more of it. And so it's, it's always a balance. So it's, it's always been a, a fun struggle for me, but I always write ever since I started writing this book with audio in mind. And now that I know him better, I, I, it definitely affects how I write it. Okay, um, we have another chat question from Dylan Tyson Ellis. What was the inspiration for Carl and Donut? So, I, I've always wanted to write this sort of story, like a uh, running man, the movie, not the book, um, style story. And I actually wrote another full book way back in like 2007 that's sitting on my computer and no one's ever going to see it. Um, about a similar idea uh and I, I decided i didn't like it so I, I i never tried to get it published but then i also before i did this i designed i drew cats for a living um to this day you can walk into ikea and buy my artwork you can um if you're in the uk you can 
by Matt Denham and greeting cards. Um, and I would go to cat shows and sell my art. And the one cat show I went to, um, the CFA champions and Cle championship in Cleveland. And <laughs> I was near this cage with the torty Persian cat. I can find the exact cat on my phone. And I, I just love that cat so much that I wanted to write a story with that cat in it. And I wasn't, you know, when I first started writing Carl, the first chapter, I wasn't expecting to ever make Donut talk. I, I, but, you know, that's just the way the, the pantser thing, it just, you know, worked out. So, yeah, we have four minutes left. So, last question. So, why Wonderwall? Do you have a specific <laughs> connection to it or, um, yeah. No, well, so I hate that song. Um, <laughs> so does Oasis. <laughs> so that first, that comes from the first book. There's a scene where they're going and I had a vision like these heavy metal kobolds, like this, they're doing like animal fighting and they're blasting death metal. And then Carl comments on the music and then, I just came up on the cuff with something completely ridiculous and random that Donut would like, and she picks Oasis, and that was just like a spur of the moment. I'm like, yeah. and then it, and then it it just turns into this thing, and then they actually suggested that I write the lyrics to Wonderwall, and I was like in Tucson, Arizona, at um, who wooed? <laughs> <laughs> I went to Sabino High School. Um, but um i i was uh, visiting family and then i had like two hours to come up with the, he wanted lyrics so i just in my hotel room i just pounded out lyrics for the wonderwall song and then like a couple days later <laughs> he had it. and so if you if, if you only read at the end of book five in the app at the end of each of the audiobooks there's little extras that only the audiobook people get and as donut singing wonderwall <laughs> Lyric with, with different lyrics. Okay. Um, I think we'll call it there. We're done. We're yeah. done. Okay. We're gonna Sorry call it for there. everybody that we missed. We really appreciate everybody that was watching online. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the panel. Let's thank Matt and Jeff. Thank you. Um, immediately afterwards, I'm going to be out there at the sound booth table. I will be signing. Um, I don't know how many books are left, but at the Falstaff booth, they have my books that you can buy, and then I will sign. Um, I don't know if we have, I don't believe we have any books at the Tom Booth table, but there's they do one have um, left. the little cassette thing.